everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight to preview and talk about Heatscape. Uh, my name is Ellen Barr. I am a former soloist with New York City Ballet and now the director of media projects for New York City Ballet. I'll be your moderator. On our panel, we have Lourdes Lopez. Lourdes danced as a soloist and principal with New York City Ballet for 24 years, uh, working with the two legends, George Balanchine and Jerome Robbins. After retiring, Lourdes joined WNBC TV in New York as a cultural arts reporter, uh, writing and producing feature segments on the arts. In 2002, Lourdes became the executive director of the George Balanchine Foundation. In 2007, she co-founded Morphosis with Christopher Wielden. She was the first artist ever elected to serve on the Ford Foundation's Board of Trustees. And in 2012, Lourdes became artistic director of Miami City Ballet. Justin Peck is only 27 years old, but he's already been hailed as a very important voice in 21st century choreography. He is currently a soloist dancer with New York City Ballet. Um, since his debut as a choreographer in 2009, he's created works for New York City Ballet, uh, LA Dance Project, Pacific Northwest Ballet, the Guggenheim Museum, and more. Um, in 2014, Justin realized a long-term dream. He was appointed resident choreographer of New York City Ballet. He's only the second person to ever hold that position at that institution. <laughs> and Shepard Ferry, who designed the backdrop for Heatscape. Shepard Ferry is from Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, he received his Bachelor of Fine Arts in Illustration at the Rhode Island School of Design. While at RISD, he created the Andre the Giant Has a Posse sticker that transformed into the Obey Giant art campaign. His work has evolved into an acclaimed body of art, which includes the 2008 Hope portrait of Barack Obama, which I'm sure you've all seen. Uh, in addition to his guerrilla street art presence, Shepard has executed more than 42 large-scale painted public murals all over the world. His works are in the permanent collections of the MoMA, the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery, Boston Institute of Contemporary Art, and the San Francisco MoMA. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> so, um, Lourdes, you've been the artistic director of Miami City Ballet for a little over two years. So what, is, uh, what are some of your main goals for the company and, and how does new work fit into that vision? Well, I don't have a, I don't have a specific vision for, for Miami City Ballet other than I want it to be a company where we perform great works, great dance works. Um, and I want it to be a company where artists such as Shepard and Justin come and want to work with us and want to work with these dancers and want to work within the art form. And a company where the dancers are growing, they're evolving, they're happy, they're developing really as, as artists. Um, so part of giving these dancers that experience involves commissioning work. And that's also the way that the art form, any art form actually evolves. New work is vital, but I think the new work, um, it has to really, for me, come from a very organic and a very, um, uh, really from a natural place uh, where both the artists find the connection between themselves um, to create something, but also where the choreographer has established a connection with the company. And so one of the great things, one of the uh, pleasures of, of really seeing Heatscape come to life with Miami City Ballet is um, our relationship with Justin grew very much like that. It was, um, there's an organization, it's an orchestral academy in Miami that's called the New World Symphony, which is headed by Michael Tilson Thomas. And one day they called me and they said, we'd love to do a project with our musicians and the dancers and would you mind choreographing something for them? And I said, I'd love it, except there's a problem, I don't choreograph, <laughs> but I know who does. So I called Justin and, um, and it was a, a pretty unusual project. He had nine days to put something together, but in the back of my mind was, I just wanna get him down here. I just want him to see these dancers. I want these dancers to see him and see what happens because once, that relationship and that bond is created with them and the choreographer, then you're gonna get a work of substance, a work that has some relevance to it. And that's exactly what happened. He came down, he, in nine days, um, we gave you a lot of hours, I think, but, we were, <laughs> <laughs> but it was still nine days, he created a pot of de, beautiful pot of de, shoots and ladders. And that's when I then approached him. I said, would you come down to do a larger commission for us in 2014? And then what happened while in Miami, 
he was coming down to rehearse and to visit quite a bit. Um, it's obviously a lot warmer in, in Miami than it is in New York during the winter. And he went to see Winwood Walls. And I remember he came into the office and he was blown away by what, by what he saw. And he said, you know, what about one of those artists for the new ballet, for the new, the new commission? I went, bingo, that's what I want. Um, and for me as an artistic director, I think because I don't choreograph, um, my creative outlet is, is really putting these artists together to see what happens um, with, you know, with any luck to, to evolve the art form. It's something that I've always been very passionate about. So uh, how did you first become exposed to Justin's work and why did you think he'd be a good fit for the company? Um, I first came exposed to him when I was with Morphosis. I, in the mail, I got a, an envelope with a DVD and a very short note written by Justin saying, um, I'd love for you to take a look at this work and give me your thoughts. And I was kind of, imp you know, I was, I was honored because I thought I had already heard a little bit about him. And uh, I think it's something that you did, Justin, you said earlier for School American Ballet to Mendelssohn's. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it was for the New York Choreographic Institute. And I was really taken by it because, first of all, it was so musical and it's just our, my background, but also he was so inventive. These are steps um, and a vocabulary and an idiom that we know and that we grew up around and yet the way he was putting them together, I had never seen. And the other thing that, that really impressed me was how he was able to move large groups of, of dancers, which I think is um, a talent that choreographers don't always have and, and that you get after years and years of really honing your craft. So those three things made me think, and then I started hearing about him and you know increases and Year of the Rabbit and started things where he was doing for New York City Ballet. And that's really, we kind of stayed friends and that's how it started. So Justin, um, how did you feel when you heard from Lourdes about doing this first piece and having all these restrictions as far as time and size? And <laughs> 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 what was your thought process there? Uh, yeah, I think initially I thought there were a lot of parameters in place for this part of it. Like it had to be very specific length and for a very specific arrangement of uh, instruments and um, cast size was specific too, but I think like uh, sometimes with those kinds of parameters, great things can amount from there. Also, I was really, you know, at the time I was really drawn to the, um, to the project because it was presented at the new Frank Gehry designed uh, symphony space, which is a 360 degree vantage point. So it was just like a different way of presenting dance from the traditional proscenium. So, um, so yeah, I was just kind of excited by all these various things. And so um, what were your first thoughts when you started to get to know the company? What, what struck you about them? Uh, I, was, I was really impressed by the company. I think first off, um, they're a real com community of, of human beings. So uh, they have very distinct personalities and um, they come together in a really sort of balanced way. Um, and in terms of their dancing, I find them to be incredibly musical, which is very important to me when I'm creating new work. And, um, and they have tremendous work ethics and they're, I think they're really, um, I think they really value the uh, creation process. Um, you know, they don't uh, commission a whole lot of work. So when someone does come down there, to work with them, they're very eager and focused, and um, so it makes for this ideal uh, environment for a choreographer to come into. Great. So let's take a look at our first excerpt of Heatscape. Justin, sure. do you want to tell us what we're about to see? Yeah, so um, this is in the first movement of the ballet, and I guess I should just say briefly that uh, I chose to set this ballet to Martin New's first piano concerto, uh, which is a pretty, um, elaborate work and challenging work, uh, but I think a work that's well suited to this company specifically. Um, so it's, it's a three movement piece and, uh, and this is, comes, falls kind of in the middle of the first movement and it's after a lot of group work and there's this moment where the cast of 17 becomes sort of like chiseled away and we're just left with these two dancers on stage. Um, it's sort of a, a quiet moment. Um, so we'll have them come out and take a look.
Justin, at New York City Ballet, where you're also a dancer, you're working with dancers who you see every day and you've known for a long time very mm -hmm. intimately. So casting is probably a more intuitive process there. How do you um, approach casting in a company where you don't have that experience? Well, I think, you know, the more experience with the company, the better. The more I can get to know the dancers, the better. And I think through the process of making the first pot that I created for Miami City Ballet, I got a chance to really get to know the company in uh, you know, a deeper way than uh, going to any other company um, out there. But I think uh, for me, it's, um, I think the fact that I'm dancing still kind of works to my advantage, so a lot of times, when I go to um, a company like Miami City Ballet, I'll, uh, I'll take class with them and um, and be a little bit more like incognito. Um, <laughs> to it them doesn't happen, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks. <laughs> so like I'm just kind of in the back doing my own thing, and I kind of you know I'm able to to watch the dancers in their element more so. So I was you know I was able to get to know the company pretty well I think before coming in to make this fuller piece for them. So um, what are some of the qualities that you found in these dancers that you cast? And uh, were you sort of listening to the music and finding qualities in the music that you then wanted reflected in the dancers? Or were you starting with the dancers and seeing qualities that appealed to you and, and then building around that? Well, I think because I got to spend a lot of time working with them, uh, I, I got to know them really well, not just as dancers, uh, but also as human beings and I got a real sense of their personalities and who these people are as individuals. And, uh, <clears throat> and so sort of through that process, I started to think about using this uh, Martineau Concerto um, for the company. And I just felt like it was a really good fit for the dancers here um, at the specific point in time. And so, um, yeah, I guess I just, I, I, my process was really just, I, I started to listen to the music a lot and um, just see uh, which dancers would emerge in my mind and, um, and uh, kind of started to take shape in that way. And, um, but you know, it's, it was, uh, there was a lot of uh, edits made, I think, through the process of developing the structure and, um, and it became like this sort of like jigsaw puzzle to see like which dancers would fit where and um, so it's kind of like a fun process for me. Yeah. When I was dancing, I always hoped to get cast by my personality. <laughs> <laughs> it's so annoying, right? <laughs> um, so Lourdes, you know, um, new work obviously requires a lot of commitment from a, from a company, you know, choreographers, you want, specific dancers, in this case Justin wanted 17 dancers, and they need a lot more time than you know people do staging something that already exists. How do you balance the needs of a new choreographer with the needs of the company for the rest of the season? Well, obviously scheduling um, goes a long way, but um, the philosophy, at least at Miami City Ballet, is when there's a new work that's being commissioned, um, the choreographer gets the hours, the studios, and the dancers that they want. Um, for several reasons. Number one is that you're going to end up getting a much better work the minute you're, you're giving the artist what they need to develop it and not really putting parameters. I mean, we place parameters for shoots and ladders, but that was a very different um, situation. So it's really, uh, you know, how many studios, how many dancers, and let's try to make this happen. Um, and the other is that it's a very, you know, it's a gift. I, I, I view it as a gift that I can give or that the organization can give to the dancers. It's a, a really a personal thing that happens when you have a, a live choreographer who's actually creating on you uh, and you're the instrument. It, it forces the dancer in a good way to grow, to really think about themselves. You you have someone who's given you information that all of a sudden makes you think differently about your dancing and who you were, who you are, what you can be. So you you want to nurture that, you want to support it, you you know, you just you want to give birth to it and, and allow it to uh, to happen. Uh, and that's that's just how I feel about it and also uh, how Miami City Ballet uh, approaches it. One of the other things that we've learned there, at least that I've learned, is that we try to give the choreographer a large chunk of time. So we give them three full weeks where the dancers are at times rehearsing nothing else but 
Heatscape or nothing else but at this commission. And that's so that the real focus is on that work. Uh, and sometimes it's four weeks. And, and that's just a commitment that we make uh, to the artist. So uh, let's watch another short excerpt. Justin, do you want to set us up? Uh, yeah. I think, is it's this? Shimon. Oh, it's Shimon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so this is uh, Shimon Ito, he's a super athletic dancer, I'm a big fan of his, and um, it's uh, just a short variation in the third movement, um, comes in like a series of, well it's, a, it's actually a pas de trois, and so it's, uh, it's three variations in a row, and, um, and he kind of uh, barrels out of the wings for this one, so we'll take a look. Just totally shot out of a cannon. I mean, it's so mean that I made him do that for sing off. Um, so, how long um, was the choreographic process for the ballet, and what stage do you feel like it's in right now? Uh, well, it's been a different process for me, I think, because I started the ballet in June. So, the kind of intense rehearsal period happened then. We spent three weeks working uh, on the material, um, and then I came back and I revisited it and continued to create new work in October, and then it doesn't premiere until the end of March. So I hope I still like it by then. But um, I think it's it's I'm used to coming into you know coming into the, into the studio and working on something and uh, you know having it premiere in a couple months from there. Uh, but I'm actually really enjoying the time kind of like the downtime in between things where I can step away and actually not even think about the ballet and then and then kind of turn it back on and start to um, t start to figure out uh, which aspects I, I really like or um, which moments I want to change or tweak or alter and so um, so it's been this kind of like um, long-term process um, with these kind of meditative moments in between so it's been cool so after um for people who might not be familiar with, with how this works, after you've actually finished creating the ballet and everyone has their steps from start to finish, what do you work on after that? Um, well, yeah, so it's, I think a lot of people maybe don't um, fully comprehend exactly what goes into making of a ballet for a choreographer when they work with a ballet company. And um, what I mean by that is uh, they, they almost take on this like director position um, to, you know, they're, they're responsible to coordinate all these different moving parts. So once they finish creating the choreography, the content, um, of the movement there, then, uh, then their job isn't done. It's like, it's just phase one is over. And then the next phase is sort of like figuring out how to, um, look at the piece on a, on a larger scope and scale and, um, uh, bringing in different uh, artistic elements, whether it be, you know, the, the music, working with the orchestra, or working with a visual design uh, element, which in this case was very much involved, and, um, and lighting and costumes and all that. So it's, um, it's yeah, it's, I guess it's just about coordinating all those different moving parts and making sure everything comes together in a really cohesive way, or hoping for that at least. And you're still uh, polishing with the dancers, like, you know, movement quality and, and getting them to do, you're really, really specific in how you want sp moments to be performed. So you're, you're still working on that as well, right? Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we just finished like the, the rough cut, I'll say, <laughs> and, then, um, and then I'll return, uh, you know, in a few weeks or, or so and, 
and we'll we'll get back into the studio and continue to refine and work on it. Yeah. So um, after the next excerpt, actually Justin will stand up and, and coach a little bit, so you'll get to see a little bit what that process is like, even after the choreography is finished, how there's still a lot more work to do. Uh, so Justin, do you want to set up this next? Yeah, um, next we have Trisha and Kleber, and this is in the second movement, and you know, like I was saying earlier, these I think uh, a lot of these dancers, um, their personalities are very much uh, prevalent in the work, and so you'll notice like a distinction, I think, between the two paradas, and um, also musically it's very different, and I, we're lucky to actually have Francisco Reno um, here with us to play uh, on the piano, and um, yeah, we'll take a look and then we'll work on it a little bit. <laughs> Great. I don't even know if I have very much to say. <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, I think that the this moment here, the um, the devote front and then down there, we can draw that out much more and add more dynamic there. So to really elongate in this moment and then come back and fast weight change. 
right afterwards to show. I think don't, don't worry about being late either. I think if you go, you hold on to this, get a little bit late, and then catch up at the end, it'll make it more interesting to play with the music. That was good. Um, <laughs> I think this first chasse turn we do here, if you think of it being more multidimensional instead of just projecting it towards the front here, especially since we're in this wonderful space and it has this kind of like circular nature to it, if we move into here and almost start back and then arc all the way around. Um, and I think you can help with that too. Um, by, how do you meet her there? But yeah, so here, and then uh, move into it. Cre create more of a movement um, in your partnering there, too. Yeah, a little more even. I think if I were Trisha and I chasséed this way, I would almost step there and come with me. Yeah, so I have to... Stay, yeah, that's good, yeah. Almost pass, yeah, and then he um, reroutes you, I think. Yeah, that was the right idea though. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> we'll work on that coordination. And then here, this moment, this moment here uh, can be after the arabesque and you come through more of a gesture and show more of a palm all, I think, because um, we have this great moment where you're growing in the arabesque and then coming through and take your time there and uh, long, yeah, that's good. What comes right after that? Oh, you know what I was gonna say? Can this part um, later on when we get to here and you go into this uh, there, it's the music, it's like, it's singing there. You know, it's, it sounds like someone just like so uh, passionately singing. And I want to feel that more in the movement that you're doing. Instead of keeping it so technical, I think it should have more emotion to uh, all of these weight changes and uh, maybe more seasick. I don't know. Can we try that with music? Um, do you have just right on... Uh, do you know where we are? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll give you an end. And. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, that's better. Um, and remember this moment here to bring her arm back slightly. Do you feel like he's a little too far? He can tell me. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, so yeah, a little bit further back. And then also, if you think to elongate the left leg and the left arm, so if we're here and we move into this, feel like there's two, um, two uh, it's like someone has your arm and someone has your leg and they're pulling them as far out as possible. So it's, um, you get to the most uh, horizontal place before you um, step out from that moment. You know what I mean? Yeah, maybe less of a jump and more focus on the développé and then stepping back. Yeah. Yeah, that was better. Almost like a transfer of the weight through arabesque, but we're stepping out to there. Yeah, that's it. Good. The rest looked good to me. Thank you. <laughs> we have to save something for tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> So let's uh, switch gears and talk about the um, visual design element. And so, Justin, you just started working with sets for the first time last year with Everywhere We Go. Right. Um, so maybe talk about a little bit more about um, 
your ideas for Heatscape and approaching Shepard? Yeah, um, well, so I started to spend a lot more time in, in Miami and I started to explore the city a lot and I started asking around like, uh, you know, wh where are the interesting neighborhoods? I wanted to go beyond South Beach and, you know, the beaches and the hotels and stuff and see what else was out there. And, um, and then I stumbled upon this neighborhood called Wynwood, uh, which in the last several years has really transformed into this street art mecca. Um, and I was so attracted to um, not only like uh, the color of the visuals, but um, how sophisticated a lot of the art was there. And, um, and I started to think that all these murals would be amazing uh, settings for movement. Um, and that kind of led you know, to more thought and I took a few days to process it and then I was like, well, what if we um, commissioned one of these artists to create something for this ballet? Um, and I started to research all these artists and got really into it and I, um, I found that I was really drawn to Shepard Ferry's work and, um, and so I, uh, you know, I, I think probably because I think his work really sits at the heart of the whole um, at the whole neighborhood. And, um, and so I started to just look at a lot of his work and I, and I started to notice it a lot more in the community of Miami, not just in Wynwood, but um, there were all sorts of murals kind of like where you least expect it. There's one uh, major mural that's like right next to the ballet theater in Miami as well. And I think we'll take, actually, I think it's the next, is it the next slide? Oh, it's a Hope poster, <laughs> the one after that. Yeah, this one here. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I thought a lot of them were just visually stunning. Um, and so at that point I, I approached Lourdes and we, we started a dialogue about, um, about the possibility of commissioning one of these artists and she was super supportive and on board from the start. And um, so we kind of worked together and uh, through a mutual friend I got in touch with Shepard just to kind of feel out if he'd be interested in working on something like this because uh, I don't think you had done anything for the theater or the ballet setting yet and so it's kind of like uncharted territory in that sense and um, and you know to my surprise he was receptive and uh, and I think excited about it, I yeah. hope. <laughs> <laughs> so actually the, the first two slides Definitely. that we had, um, Obey and the Hope poster yeah. are two just very famous examples of Shepard's work. But Shepard, why don't you talk to us a little bit about what your primary influences are as an artist and how you get your inspiration? Sure. Um, ballet wasn't one of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, um, I, I grew up drawing, and uh, I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. It's pretty conservative there. And uh, I, I enjoyed drawing and painting, but it wasn't until, until I got into skateboarding and punk rock about 30 years ago that, um, that I really saw a connection between art and, and things that were very visceral. And, uh, you know, skateboarding and punk rock are very physical activities. So, um, you know, my, my eventual connection to to the ballet was uh you know even though they're very different cultures the uh you know the idea of connecting art to something that uh you know that has a, has a real emotional physicality to it so uh I got into skateboarding and punk rock which were opposed to you know any any sort of uh mainstream activity and uh and you know the government and any you know the mainstream whatever um and and I got into the idea of carving out your own creative voice within, uh, you know, by any means necessary, do it yourself. I love that idea of self-empowerment. So I started to make homemade t-shirts and homemade stickers, but it was really when I went to the Rhode Island School of Design in 1988 and we were taking a trip to New York City to go to the, to the Met. Um, on the way in, going th uh, along 95 and the Cross Bronx Expressway and then the West Side Highway, seeing all these amazing graffiti pieces that were done by you know people who had code names that I was uh, I was energized by uh, you know by this willingness to take risks and 
they dropped everybody off at the Met, and I didn't go into the Met. I would just walked around the city to look at the graffiti. <laughs> and, um, and, and so uh, this idea of art for everyone, that it was in, in, you know, in public spaces where people lived and you didn't have to go to a gallery or a museum, I really liked that idea because even though I'd spent much of my life learning how to draw and paint and, and being around people who appreciated art, I felt that it was, uh, it was a bit too narrow. So, um, you know, I, I became intrigued by propaganda posters from the Soviet Union and Cuba and political art from Barbara Kruger and Robbie Canal. And it was really a synthesis of all those different things that ended up um, leading me in the, in the direction um, that I took for my work. But, you know, the idea of doing work in public spaces uh, one, because I was too insecure to get approval from galleries, and two, <laughs> because I wanted to have a, you know, a, a direct, unmediated relationship with the public. Um, you know, those were, uh, those were the two sides of the coin there. So we have some uh, slides of Wynwood Walls and other pieces in Miami that particularly inspired Justin and are great representations of your work. So maybe let's move on to the next slide and you guys can sort of tell us a little bit about these and, and Shepard, what you know inspired you to create them, and Justin, what inspired you about them? Uh, well, this was the first mural of Shepard's that I saw, and it sits kind of right at the center of of Wynwood, and uh, so it kind of um, sparked the initial thought, I think, to to bring Shepard on board, and um, I just I love the graphic nature of it and the the use of color. I think it's it's a very specific color scheme, but very effective at the same time, and. Um, and the various uh, figures and point of ins points of inspiration, which I think Shepard can elaborate a little bit more on, was was interesting to me as well. So. Sure. The um, th this piece uh, is in a, a sort of a compound enclave called the Winwood Walls. It has a a large number of I, I think some of the most important um, street artists, graffiti artists. People who inspired me, Futura, Retina, Kenny Scharf, Maya Hayek, uh, Swoon, a lot of amazing people and, and a lot of what's on the walls is, uh, it, you know, it's, it's curated and it's changing over time but I really, um, I didn't necessarily deserve to but I got one of the most prominent places in that, in that area and it was all facilitated by a, a guy named Tony Goldman, who is, is a real estate developer. He uh, passed away a couple years ago, but um, that's him in the center of the piece. He's a real estate developer here, also in Philadelphia and in Miami, and a, and a real supporter and advocate of the arts. His whole family is. And uh, they do a project here that people might have seen. It's on the corner of, of uh, Houston and Bowery, and right now it's, uh, it's under renovation, but. Uh, back in the 80s, Keith Haring had a mural there. Kenny Scharf had a mural there. Kenny Scharf also has a mural there in the Wynwood Walls. But when, uh, when, when Tony was a big supporter of my work, I got to do a mural at Houston and Bowery and uh, in, a, in, a, in a spot that I'd done illegal, illegally many times. Um, <laughs> so very <laughs> ironic, I guess, you know, if you can't beat them, join them sort of situation. But um, I, uh, you know... I wanted to do this mural as a bit of a, of a tribute to, to Tony and his family and find some common ground. So in a sense, this is a collaborative piece, just like uh, the, the Miami Ballet backdrop is a collaborative piece with Justin for, for Heat Wave. But um, I talked to Janet, Tony's widow, and she said, um, well, you know, I think you and Tony have a lot of heroes in terms of... Uh, art, music, uh, s social theory, philosophy in common. So um, here's some of the people that Tony was really into that I know you dig as well. So I made this piece that was a, a synthesis of, uh, of our sources of inspiration as well as having a, a sort of pro-environment, pro-nature theme um, woven into it as well. Great. Let's look at another one. So this was another piece that I did near Wynwood in the design district in Miami. Um, and I think that Justin had stumbled upon this piece as well. This is in progress. Um, it, it, uh, it's, a, it's a mandala piece. And, you know, I love, um, I love the concept of, of mandalas, you know, the, the harmony, the concept of harmony and, and, uh, and integration. But um, you know, also, they're, as, as ornaments, they're really pleasing to create um, 
And, uh, and also from a technical standpoint, when I was first learning how to paint murals, the idea of how I was gonna transfer an image to the wall, I made this uh, like, a, like, a, like a pizza, um, where it's actually eight different, eight different slices repeated. And so I made a stencil of one slice and then just figured if I did the math right, I'd get around to the other side and it would all work out. Um, but the, uh, j this is another piece that Justin saw that I think he was uh, um, somewhat inspired why, by in seeing its connection to um, the, the, the circular motion of, of the dancers and some of the, some of the choreography that he was interested in. Um, and so, you know, we, once we eventually started talking about the piece, my process of creating mandalas was something that, that, we, that we discussed and it was really amazing that that ended up in a way impacting um, or, you know, part of, part of the choreography. I feel very fortunate for that, <laughs> thank you. Um, but, yeah, thank um, you. but anyway, that, you know, that was uh, another piece in Miami and I think, yeah, there's the, the next yeah. slide, it's just a process shot one. of that. Yeah. So there it is, it's very a rough wall, but it ended up <laughs> looking smooth in the end, so. Yeah, I remember seeing this, it, it was actually just like a, a pizza joint across the street, and I was getting pizza one day, and I looked up, and there's this tremendous mural um, above me, and I just remember thinking that it looked like some sort of odd blueprint for a choreographic movement, and I was like, what if we take uh, this um, concept, which is based on uh, on creating from the center outwards in a very kind of like detailed, meticulous fashion. And what if we applied that to, to choreography, like what would come of that? And so what happened was we developed these sort of like mandala inspired choreographic um, structural patterns and uh, movements. Uh, um, and I wish we had the cast of 17 with us because it yeah. involves so many of the dancers and we could show you and it would fit so well in this circular space. <laughs> but um, but you'll just have to buy a ticket to come to Miami <laughs> <laughs> instead. And so let's look at what else we have. So this is, uh, this is actually the, the, the previous iteration of the Wynwood Walls piece that, uh, that, that you saw the Tony Goldman portrait of. So um, this was originally done in, in 2009 when they were first developing this complex and it was all done uh, in a, in a, um, with a different technique. Um, the one with Tony Goldman is all painted. This was all done with wheat pasting, pieces, different pieces of wallpaper that I had printed and painted in my studio. And I developed that technique from um, years of needing to try to take over large spaces in cities but without permission and doing it before the police arrived. So, <laughs> um, so, so, you know, in, in, um, you know, in some regards, the you know my uh, my concerns about efficiency ended up impacting my aesthetic, which now become a choice rather than a necessity. But uh, you know, I think I think that the um, you know always the challenges of how you can deal with the constraints of a situation sometimes um, make you do your best work. So I uh, you know I, th I think that a cool analogy with this with this mural to to the dance piece is you know that there's, you know, there are all these pieces and you have to decide how they're gonna come together. And, uh, you know, I'm using, I'm using a lot of motifs that have, uh, that have the ability to be, to be repeated, but then, um, but then it's not always a perfect pattern. So there's, uh, you know, there's, there's disruption there. But I think Justin had also seen this uh, online and you liked some of the, there's some of the, the specific elements that he liked within this piece that ended up being part of our process of, uh, of coming to the backdrop. So yeah, let's look at the next slide. Shepard, how do you stop your work from being vandalized? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you did it. <laughs> What's yeah. Well, and, <laughs> and, and, and that's why I can't complain about it without being a hypocrite. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I can't stop it from being vandalized. And, and one of the things that is, I, I think, important to your, to your um, survival as a, as a street artist is, um, is not being too precious. And, you know, it's ironic because, you know, I, as a creator, the idea of making something that you're proud of is, is, is essential. But for me, making the piece, being proud of the end result, basking in it for about 30 seconds, and then moving on, 
is really important. And um, you know, anything that's ephemeral. I mean, these uh, it, these dance pieces. Of course, you can you can videotape it, but really that you know that moment of experiencing it firsthand. There's nothing that can really that can really replicate that experience. So for me, like making the piece, finishing it, interacting with some of the people who saw the process. That's really that's really visceral. It's really exciting. But then it's time to do the next thing. And of, of course, uh, if I can, if something gets tagged, I'll go and I'll and I'll um, and I'll try to touch it up because a lot of times, you know, I, I like to say haters never prosper. But um, <laughs> anyway, um, I you know, I <laughs> I will go back. But really, uh, when it comes down to my true philosophy, I'm um, even if I think their energy is misplaced. I'm more of an advocate for the rebel with a can of black spray paint than I am for, uh, you know, Bank of America. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so well, now we're actually looking at a, an early iteration of the backdrop that you two created together. So do you want to sort of talk us through um, the development of the backdrop? Yeah, I think uh, we, we started to, to talk about a lot of uh, reoccurring symbols in Shepard's work that... Uh, existed kind of in dance and in ballet, and one of them we, we see here is, is this this bird symbol. And of course, there's there's a constant reoccurring presence of the bird as a as a symbol in, in classical ballet. And and um, you know we have this we have this female figure in uh, ballet, kind of um, at least through uh, uh, George Balanchine's philosophy, has been thought of as being a feminine art form and. Uh, very much like empowering to the female form and um, and you know various others I think we, we talked about like lotus flower images and um, and how these they're these uh, amazingly beautiful uh, um, um, symmetrical uh, pieces in, in nature and um, but at the same time they're these these uh, living breathing and fleeting uh, um, organisms that, um, in the same way as uh, as a ballet, don't last. Um, so they're they're there for a moment and then they're gone. Um, and so we tried to like um, look into the the meaning behind a few of these symbols and and try to incorporate them into um, into uh, or or at least kind of like let them inform what the um, the backdrop would would become and. And we went through a few phases of that, and this was kind of uh, one of the initial uh, drops we we developed together. And um, also, um, one thing I find really beautiful about Shepard's work, and and you can see it in this mural, is the kind of um, uh, textural aspect of it. If you look a little bit uh, more closely, you'll you'll notice that there's um, there's uh, um, quite a bit put into um, the detailing and uh, and you know a lot of meticulous work that that went into um, the design of this and uh, so yeah this was phase one. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at the next slide. Yeah, so this is just another another iteration. Um, Justin had liked uh, the the the, uh, the lotus element and uh, you know some of the other the rays, some of the other pieces. So uh, he'd also seen a mural that I did in, uh, in Dumbo in Brooklyn that I did on top of a brick wall. And I, I loved the character of the brick. It was aged, aged brick. It's um, you know, something that you, know, you, you feel like it's had a life and there's stories to tell from the surface itself. So I just painted a one color mural on top of that um, with, a, with a little bit of varnish over the brick so that the, you know, the, the history of the brick still was a, an, a, an integral part of the piece. So replicating that in what I was, uh, what I was trying to create for, for Justin was important. But you know, uh, I, I liked these pieces, but it, you know, as Justin fine-tuned the choreography and thought about what, what the needs were for the piece and what I'd done, he, um, you know, he, he had adapted his vision, he evolved his vision, and you know, I was, uh, I was perfectly happy with that because I really felt like, um, you know, the, watching some of his pieces, video of some of his old pieces, the, you know, the, um, the gestures of the dancers, the silhouettes of the dancers, 
there's art in that and the idea, and that's the most essential art really. So the idea of anything that I would do competing with that was um, something that I really um, felt would, would be an injustice. So, um, you know, I, I, that's the great thing about collaboration. We could bounce ideas and, uh, and I, um, you know, I, I enjoy that because with my work, I like to leave no stone unturned. I like to experiment a lot. And anything that I discover, even if it doesn't work for Justin, I'll recycle it later. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at another slide. I think that you can see some of that development there. Can you talk about maybe the change on the bottom? Yeah, so this was, um, this was a, uh, a, the first phase as well. And, you know, I had created, I knew that Justin liked the dove so, and some of the pattern work. So this was my idea that uh, I, would, I would make the image less contrasty at the bottom to not compete with the dancers as much. Um, but, you know, quickly after round one, uh, Justin started to, he started to, to zoom in on what he thought would work. And so we, you know, we abandoned this, but this was, this was one of the other ideas. I think like also over time, you know, the, through the process of, of developing the choreography, like the original intent for what was needed visually also uh, changed. And so there came a point in the process where we had to kind of like go back and say like, look, this piece turned into something uh, different than what I originally envisioned. And like, let's see how we can uh, adapt the visuals to really like best enhance um, the experience, I think, so. So let's look at another slide. Yeah, that was uh, an, another one that was inspired uh, by a mural that I had done in, uh, in Los Angeles that used this, uh, what I call the peace elephant. Um, but once again, uh, same, same thing. Justin, Justin liked this image, and it was one of the things he had mentioned as, uh, as appealing to him. But he had, he had really refined his vision. And, uh, and, you know, for me, I make a lot of work and throwing things out there, I'm not, I'm not too precious about it. I, um, you know, I think that it, in any, um, the reputation of artists as prima donnas, I, um, I'm really trying to, to counter that. Um, you know, I, I get to draw and paint all day. I mean, I'm so lucky. Um, so the idea of doing, um, giving Justin a few more things to pull from, especially when it's from my, the, you know, the body of work that I, you know, I, I've built over the years and he's, he's drawing his inspiration from things that I've already put on walls. It's a very easy process to give him more options and keep evolving what we're, what we're trying to do. So let's look at the next one. So this is the final version that we honed in on. Um, I think it's, it's also just important for me to iterate that, you know, there's, there's not necessarily like uh, a specific like narrative that uh, this drop or this ballet insinuates, but that it's more about um, about the piece being this um, this symbiotic meeting point between all these various artistic mediums and just like creating a cohesive experience for viewers to um, you know to to uh, kind of like, I guess, tickle their senses. So, uh, you know, if, whether it be visual or, or movement or music. And, um, and so, yeah, I think like the way that this whole process developed was um, I started to, um, to organically take on these influences early on and then I brought Shepard on um, to work on this. And it's kind of like throwing everything into a pot and like adding heat and see what comes out of it. And, um, uh, and yeah, I guess, I mean, there's a lot of different, just different influences in this work specifically, but I think uh, we achieved the proper balance with this final version in regards to, um, to, to how we broke up um, the drop specifically and, um, and how it relates to the movement and how it kind of like frames the dancers and, um, and I can't wait to see it live, yeah, <laughs> soon. So, um Justin, having talked to you a lot over the years, and I know you pretty well by now, I know you're always looking to challenge yourself. You approach each new work as an opportunity to expand rather than maybe repeat what's worked for you in the past. So what are some ways that you are uh, challenging yourself with this ballet, with um, pushing some ideas 
maybe a little further than you have before? Um, well, well, I've always been interested in working with groups and kind of breaking up the traditional hierarchy of ballet and um, and I think this this piece takes it even one step further by um, kind of empowering the individual, but uh, I think uh, it, it's about bringing together um, 17 very much distinct individuals into um, one collective space. Um, so so it's a it's a, a um, slight alteration in my process and. Um, and also the music is just, was sort of a, a mountain to tackle, it seemed like. Um, uh, I was really excited about it from the get-go um, and through the process of, you know, developing the work, it, um, it, it really challenged me in so many ways. I think rhythmically it's, it's really tough and, um, but I think in the end it's gonna be really rewarding and the dancers, like I said earlier, they're super musical and, um, and they're capable of, of moving to it, so. So you'll see in this next excerpt, you can um, get a better sense of what Justin's talking about, even though we don't have the whole group, about how sometimes dancers break away and they're in the spotlight and then they sort of join the group again and they become the core or the backdrop for uh, someone else who's broken away and taken in the spotlight, which is different from sort of how traditional classical structure works, where someone who's in the center is always in the center, and someone who's on the side is always on the side. Mm. Um, and there was another aspect of this excerpt that you mentioned that was interesting about how the dancers sort of rush the stage. Yeah, so I think I was, uh, typically when you look at, at traditional ballet, um, you have the dancers on stage and they sort of present towards the front and they move forward and um, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty typical uh, way of presenting dance but I think with this uh, specific ballet I was um, interested in kind of like turning that concept upside down and so what, what we have is um, we immediately set the dancers at the very front lip of the stage and and um, and then we worked on developing how the dancers can um, can create certain structural movements moving from the front backwards. Um, so it was just like an interesting uh, challenge that was kind of like that we just kind of put on ourselves and to just to see what would result. And uh, and also, you know, I. I was I was interested in finding a way to kind of like connect the visual element to um, to the audio element, uh, that being the orchestra, um, right off the bat. And so we have this kind of like um, visceral rush from the dancers that move from the the uh, the um, upstage point to the downstage point um, in an instance, and it uh, it kind of creates this electricity that links those two sides and um, so I was, I was excited about that and um, we're gonna see kind of like a, an abridged version, like a five person version, but it's actually when um, the ballet is actually performed, it's, it's actually 17 dancers, so keep that in mind when you're watching. <laughs> Thank you. 
Shepard, what, what has been the biggest takeaway for you from this process? Have your ideas about ballet changed at all? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> The, um, you know, I, I actually was exposed to a good amount of, of ballet because I would always do summer programs for art, uh, visual art and performing art at the Brevard art, uh, College, North Carolina School of the Arts, uh, RISD. There was a lot of dance happening there. I went to a, a boarding school called the Otto Wilde School of Music and the Arts, and I actually um, participated in some pas de deux because I, I had a crush on the girl that I was partnering with. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> But I was not nearly flexible enough um, <laughs> to really pull it off. But, um, but you know, what, what uh, I think like any art form, you know, what goes into it, the, the amazing discipline, practice, rigor, um, it, it's, it's incredibly inspiring to see the dedication that the people have. And, you know, and it re reminds me to, um, you know, to always, um, no matter what I achieve, to, to push my craft and, uh, and, you know, put the time in, which I think... I do, but um, but it's you know you you, it, you can never get too comfortable because there's always somebody younger, fitter, uh, more talented that's going to come along. So I you know I, I love seeing the end result of that kind of discipline and the th connection I see between a lot of my more recent work that's sort of focused on um, peace and harmony and a more f feminine side of things because I'm married and I have two daughters, so I'm, I'm surrounded by it, but. Um, <laughs> But the, uh, um, you know, the, the, the beauty of the, of the sort of feminine side of things, the family unit that, uh, you know, I think that the movement in dance, the form, the, you know, the, uh, all of the different shapes that you see, it all um, is something that's, you know, it's beautiful, but it takes a lot of practice. The, you know, the idea of the difficulty of something that looks effortless in a way. And, I, you know, I think Justin... One of the things I like about Justin, though, is that he's taking what I think is uh, uh, from the history of ballet, things that are proven to be aesthetically appealing, but he's also tweaking them a bit in challenging ways. Um, I, that's what I strive for in art. I look at, and I've been accused of it all the time, of taking inspiration from historical art forms, um, and, and I'm very guilty of it, but I'm always filtering it through my sensibility. Seeing Justin do that is in, in his you know, in, in his art form is very inspiring to me. So, you know, this idea of, um, you know, uh, striving for the best and then the ability to cross-pollinate different art forms that I can share my work with a ballet audience and that a ballet audience, um, you know, might be turned on to this other art form and the street artist uh, might be turned on to ballet. You know, this is, this is all exciting to me. So those are the, those are the takeaways. So, Lourdes, what's been most exciting for you seeing this come together? What do you think it's bringing to, to your dancers and your audience? I think what it's bringing actually to the art form is, is it proves to me once again that dance is powerful enough to absorb all these other art forms. Um, <laughs> that it can, it, you know, we, we can take it in and, and, and produce something. I think in terms of the dancers, what's um, wonderful to see is what we spoke about earlier, that uh, to having a live choreographer choreograph on you uh, forces the artist, forces them to, to evolve. And then they take that growth into their other rep. They take that growth into other works that they've done. Um, and then what happens to me as an artistic director is I have a very different dancer in front of me that I all of a sudden see in a different light, that's dancing a different way, that I can move um, in, a, in a different manner that was not available to me because they've been exposed to this. So anything, my philosophy is that anything that I can do to get a better dancer, a better work, a better company, uh, a better performance, which is gonna relate to all of you guys, um, I'm all for it, and clearly they're doing that. <laughs> um, before we, we sign off with our, our final excerpt, um, if, you're, if you're enjoying this and interested in the process of dance making and collaboration, you might have seen on your seats you had a postcard for a film called Ballet 422. It actually is a verite documentary feature length that shows a lot of the things that we've been talking about today. Um, through just a fly on the wall um, verite style, showing Justin working on his third ballet at New York City Ballet. Um, and that is opening at Film Society of Lincoln Center and Sunshine Cinema on February 6th and in Miami on February 20th. And uh, Heatscape has its uh, first performance on March 27th. 
um, in West Palm Beach oh, yes. and then moves to Miami in April. So you're really just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Obviously, you're only seeing five dancers. This is a, a, a huge cast with a lot of complexity and they're all amazing. Um, so if you're going to be in Miami or if you have friends in Miami, don't let them miss it. Um, so before we, we see our final excerpt, I just want to thank uh, Mary Sharp Cronson and her amazing staff at Works in Process. Um, I'd also like to thank our, our pianist, our dancers, our panelists, and you for coming out. Um, enjoy and tell your friends about this. <laughs>